Hey, in today's video, I do want us to talk about how I became a radical leftist with a small disclaimer that the word radical in the United States just means you want very basic things like healthcare and housing for all. So honestly, I don't even think I'm a radical, but according to mainstream media, I would be considered a radical leftist. But anyway, that's what today's video is about and I will tell you my story as soon as I tell you about my haircut. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like it's the elephant in the room if I don't and so if you don't care if you're one of those people like me that doesn't like very long introductions please go ahead and fast forward to the real part of the video <laughs> And so anyway, yes, I cut off all my hair. I would like to think it's because I already went through my existential crisis the last year. I like to think it's me being reborn after the horrible year that we had last year. And I have been waiting for this haircut. I haven't had a professional haircut in a whole year. It's a new era, like as things are opening back up again. And like, of course, let's be honest, we're not at a point where COVID is like done and everybody's like, okay to go resume their lives. I think we are slowly starting to feel like we can begin to resume our lives in some way or another but i don't know about you for me as i start to do that little by little everything's different my entire routine is different because now i i'm lucky enough to work from home and my gym is kind of like split between two gyms now and it's just everything's weird and i finally went back to the gym last saturday today's tuesday and i just felt like oh my god obviously that's what that was what's missing in my life like i feel like the gym is where i go work out like everything that's going on with my life it's like a of course it's a physical activity but it's very mental for me martial arts are very like introspective and a place where you work things out with yourself and that's what i've been missing in my life and anyway that doesn't even have anything to do with my hair but I used to have a pixie cut like 10 years ago and I feel like I got it done against my will because what happened is I wanted short bangs I wanted like really cute you know Amelie I wanted the Amelie bangs and so I just cut them myself and I messed up and then I cut them again and my bangs got so short it was disgusting like my bangs no joke were like right here and this was like and this was like 2009 and like that was not cool and like now if anybody has really short bangs it's like oh she's cool like i don't know some kind of artistic soul that is just trying to express themselves but i don't think we were there at that point <laughs> so anyway the point i'm trying to make is that i got this pixie cut in order to fix my hair because literally like nothing would cover it up so i kind of got it done against my will but what I discovered is that when you don't have long hair, like if you have long hair, when you look down, your hair kind of covers you. And when you don't have long hair, it's like, number one is just your face that's facing the world. And there is nothing for you to hide behind. There's no like pretending that you didn't see that stranger, <laughs> pretending that you're not seen out of the corner of your eye. And I don't know, I just, I just wanted to change. And on a kind of gross personal level, my hair got for whatever reason i also struggled with dandruff last year i don't know if that's at all connected to like mental health or anything because i felt like my entire life was out of whack last year and i just used dandruff shampoo so much that my entire hair was so dry and it at times wouldn't curl properly so i just like just take it all off whatever and i was inspired to get this haircut because i've been watching that show on netflix money heist it's a spanish series called la casa de papel and it's so badass if you're looking for a new netflix show i really recommend it you will have to read subtitles because it's in spanish the show is suspenseful like every single episode and one of the main characters has this haircut and i just thought it looked so cool and i have been seeing like little mullets coming back on social media but I wasn't sure until I saw her cause it's like a baby mullet like I, it's not really like party in the back it's just literally like just a little long so I'm excited for my hair to grow like a little bit cause I feel like the back is really short um but so far I like it and we'll see how long I have it for I feel like this is a new era we're reinventing ourselves constantly as humans and I'm ready for whatever's next so anyways 
how did I become a radical leftist? And I hate this phrase because I don't think I'm the radical for wanting everybody to have healthcare, shelter, access to food, access to a job should they want one. The fact that so many people have been brainwashed into not wanting themselves to have basic things for survival when there's only one earth and there are there's no human that is the owner of the earth it is one earth for all of us to me the fact that some people don't want others to have those basic things that should be the radical idea and let's not talk about how the right is constantly brainwashing you about how that's the right way to live but anyways maybe that's another video for another time but for me personally and this video is just my story honestly I, the only thing i feel like makes me a radical is the fact that yeah i often create videos paintings all kinds of anything on social media to get people to be more interested in this kind of ideas i do agree that that makes me more of a radical but whatever this video is just working under the assumption that there's a high likelihood that you also live in the united states and you're also constantly being told that you're a radical leftist if you want other people to have basic human survival things in an accessible way so anyway so for me my radical leftist journey begins growing up uh, most of you know by now that i was born in costa rica I spent about three years in Nicaragua and then I moved to the US when I was 12. But because most of my family is from Nicaragua, I was constantly traveling there. Like for example, we would spend our Christmas in Nicaragua every year with my aunt or most of the time. What stood out to me the most when I was little is that there really are no absolutes. And I, of course I didn't have those words growing up, but the first thing that I noticed was, for example, when I lived in Costa Rica and we would study our history, there was this one specific battle that they would teach us, like, we won that battle. Like, now Costa Rica doesn't have an army, but at one point it did, or I don't know if it was like, just people took up arms and had a fight with Nicaragua for some territory or whatever. I really don't remember, I was too young to remember. But I never forget that when I learned that like history lesson in Costa Rica, the Costa Rican people have won that battle, war, whatever it was. And when I moved to Nicaragua that same year, I learned that the Nicaraguans, they had won that battle. And so right then and there, and I think I'm pretty sure I already told you guys this story in another video, like I was like, uh, no, hello, Costa Ricans won that battle, excuse you. They were like, no. But that was like the first instant in which I understood that two people can look at the same issue completely differently. The same thing happened um, with the way that we live. Like for example, in both Costa Rica and Nicaragua, religion was a huge part of my life. Especially in Costa Rica because we went to a church that had like mass for kids. And so it was like fun and it was like, very vivid i remember going to mass every sunday i would make my mom take me to mass you know i did like catechism i did my first communion later in nicaragua i was still involved with the church one part of my family my uncle and his family they were really into their church and so i would often spend time at their church and hanging out with you know my cousins with them and then the moment that i moved to the u.s i never once again stepped into a church it just wasn't part of everyday life for most people at least you know in l.a where i live in Burbank at the time, like none of my classmates were going to church. My cousins that lived here were not going to church either, only my grandma. And so once again, I'm kind of introduced into a, this completely different way of living. And I'm no longer being told that it's wrong not to practice religion or that I'm going to go to hell or whatever you want to, whatever. You know all the kinds of things you're told if you you know, grow up with religion in your life. I never heard any of them again. Like maybe my grandma once or twice was like, don't you want to come with me to mass? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> Cause by then I had gotten over it. I was like, I didn't really understand like how to make sense of religion and things like evolution, the dinosaurs. And anyway, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is very early on, I just saw that there are so many different ways of looking at one situation and every person might think that they're right but 
they could be have completely different takes on one issue and so when i grow up and it's like why would you care if other people are, are a different race and they want to have the same rights as you why would you care if people want to date whoever they want to date why would you care if somebody feels like they're a different gender why would you care if somebody dresses differently like i, I just really had like an open mind ever since i can remember i think because of those experiences because i learned that there is no like one way of living people can look at things very differently and i think another thing that really affected me was seeing the level of poverty in nicaragua you would always see this one kid who had to be a, a teenager at the time and everybody knew of him because he walked down the street every day and he didn't have a home um, he was always dirty he was always like sniffing glue I might have to censor that, I don't know if that you can see that on YouTube, but... <laughs> so not only was I seeing him on an almost daily basis, but I was also, anytime that I got into a car, at any stop sign, little kids come around to clean your windows. I don't know if you guys have experienced that in like other parts of the world, where like kids start to clean your car's windows so that you would, you know, tip them for cleaning, and so you always have to be like battling like you know don't wash don't wash my windows or you let them and then you tip them or or they like look after your car when you park at like i don't know the what are those called like the swap meet kind of marketplaces and i always wonder like what do those kids do that they don't have like enough why why don't they have a family why did they end up in this situation or do they have a family but they don't have enough there's nothing that we did that was like spectacular or like helped us not have that kind of life it was totally like luck whether people have more or not i know so many people that get so pissed off when you say that most people that are rich got there because they are rich privileged they have opportunities and they often feel like you're denying that they worked hard at all but so much of successful people or people that just have like their basic things in life so much is that so much of that is just luck like you can't choose what your ancestors are you can't choose the family you're born into like i just got lucky of course i keep working and doing all that i can so that i don't end up in a position like that but at the end of the day you just never know what kind of life situation you'll walk into and oftentimes it has nothing to do with how hard you're trying or your worth as a human being so that's how i feel like my life experiences have contributed to me having a very open mind and just feeling like people should have access to the basic things shelter food healthcare, a job doesn't mean that they have to be millionaires and just because of what i said earlier like there's literally one planet earth and so we should all be sharing its fruits like literally there's enough resources for everybody to have a dignified life, you know? Now, when all this began to make a lot more sense, and I really do think then I began to be like radicalized, <laughs> indoctrinated into the Marxist ideology, um, was college. <laughs> <laughs> of course the first class had a really huge impact on me was introduction to art history class because i remember vividly one of the very first days in class the professor had us look at this benetton ad he's like tell me where that man is right now and literally everybody was like that's a man in africa he's probably like a rebel or some kind of like military trained and the more we kept analyzing the ad the professor was like well look at what he's wearing he's wearing khakis and he's wearing a wedding ring so how what what lets you know that it's in africa and so through that class he basically helped us understand how media is constantly shaping how you look at people of color especially but it's constantly shaping the narrative that is in your head with visual cues and that is just literally conditioning you through life to look at people a certain way and that's when it occurred to me that oh we are we are the ones that are actively being indoctrinated towards the racist close-minded right-wing ideology actually and so there needs to be an effort to like undo that conditioning and 
that's where I agree where like I am a radical leftist because I want to undo that conditioning versus somebody who is a leftist and but they they're not that like invested in changing I don't know the course of I don't know people and how they think or whatever but that was like that first big clue as to like moving me towards some kind of like sense of urgency of why this is so important to do now the other class that had a huge impact on me i think it was called intro to latin american history i don't remember but the way that my professor taught it and by the way it's one of my favorite professors jonathan ablard at ithaca college but the way my professor taught that class was that if you understand the history of the u.s then you understand the history of latin america because they're constantly interacting with one another throughout history or i should say the united states is always meddling with latin american nations throughout their history and even though i could go on and on about that class because i actually discovered so much about myself in that class what really stood out to me in terms of being like radicalized was reading this one book it was called the cia's classified accounts of its operations in Guatemala in 1952 through 1954. And what this book is, is literally internal documents from the CIA literally put together and redacted. And the reason why this stood out to me so much is because anyone, look, anyone can say all that they want about the United States is meddling in this person's history or this person's like um, government or nation, but this was the United States itself saying yes we meddled in guatemala's government straight up <laughs> and like the accounts it was a bunch of like letters from like you know the officials sending letters to other people like this is what you're gonna do of course redacted for like sensitive information but you could really easily put together from the context of the letters what all the redacted like items were and again it was one of those situations where like okay the United States government is actively, actively destroying and meddling with democratically elected officials who are doing good for the majority of the working class in Latin America, like by their own admission. And again, that level of urgency of like, there needs to be a pushback against things like that, that just rose in me once again. And after that class is when I legitimately started to study Latin American studies for my minor because number one, it was really helping me to understand myself but I also just wanted to know the depth of US involvements with Latin America and what is, what is it all about. And as you guys may or may not know, like once I left Ithaca College, I dropped out of school took a one-year break and then I signed up for school in LA and then once I was in LA for my diversity credit so what I did was take this intro to film class where it was an introduction to race, gender, and class in media and it was funny because it's once again very similar to that art history class where it was teaching you how visual media is constantly shaping the way you think about certain races or about how we portray people of a gender or a class, etc, etc. And to me, this class was important because although it might be like a little bit obvious, all of my studies up to that point have mostly been focused on Latin American people. But in this class, we were learning even about how like, for example, Asian people are portrayed on TV. Like Asian men are often portrayed as docile or in one way or another kind of like repressed for lack of a better word and obviously that's not true there are all kinds of people they have all kinds of personalities and so it kind of just helped me take my you know what i was learning already about the world and media and you know visual representation just kind of like a more well-rounded view of that and also brought it up to like real time because we were examining movies that were more like um just more more of the times you know like the 2000s and stuff like that and then it was a lot easier for me to analyze the stuff i was watching on tv after class and how are they portraying certain characters certain races etc etc certain like stereotypes in general but i would say for me the final most radicalizing 
class that I had in college was my Mexican mirrorless class. My very last quarter in college for an elective, I took an art history class that focused on the three big Mexican mirrorless, Diego Rivera, Alfaro Siqueiros, Orozco, and Frida Kahlo. Because of her relationship with um, Diego Rivera, it was kind of, she kind of fit into what they were doing at the time, whatever. So let me back up. So in my major, I was studying Spanish literature. What I really began to love were like this whole concept of creating a nation, building a nation. And for those of you guys that like didn't study this or might not know about it. So throughout the 1800s through the 1900s, Latin American nations were breaking free from their colonial um, powers and declaring independence and of course they were trying to figure out how to create national identities that were separate from their colonial past it was like you know reclaiming their own power and so i learned a lot about like writers that would try to kind of create a national identity or bring to the forefront like more indigenous stories or like customs that were not viewed as highly throughout colonial times but were now being reclaimed as you know their national traditions and identity and when i went on to take this muralist class it was the first time that this idea was presented to me from the point of view of the artist of like like a visual artist um, and not a writer or an intellectual and it was so cool to me to see how you can do also that thing. You can create an identity, a cultural identity for a nation through visual media. And that's what like people like Diego Rivera try to do. They try to elevate their roots, their history, educate their viewers. Because they were doing murals, their art was in the streets, it was free. They wanted to educate people for free, the everyday person that walked the streets. and. That idea to me was so powerful that eventually it was like, well, I want to figure out how I can do something potentially similar. I'm obviously not a mirrorless, and at that point I didn't even paint, but but I was already very drawn to artists like Banksy, Shepard Fairey, Frida Kahlo, Basquiat, and I didn't understand why until I took that course. It was because all these people were trying to share these ideas of social justice and like break away break free from like our mental chains our colonial roots in one way or another and um or just kind of or just kind of making like statements about the political systems in which we exist and once i really became like obsessed with this idea i try to figure out like well how can i do that and then once i started painting i was like well how can i mix them and like i said this is one area well i will admit that i am a radical in the, in the sense that i feel a sense of urgency in wanting to help other people be empowered and move away from all of this disempowering conditioning that capitalism brings to you in one way or another through all kinds of layers media you know the things that values in our society who gets rewarded whatever whatever etc etc in that regard yes i am a radical radical leftist wanting to give you health care but yeah that is my how I became a radical leftist story. <laughs> I don't really know where I wanted to go with this video. I just felt like I wanted to share my story and feel free to share yours in the comment section. It's always really interesting. I feel like that's why when people like get very combative with me in the comment section of YouTube, I feel like people want me to convince them of my point of view or they want to convince me of their point of view. And I don't think that I'm going to convince anybody. I think every person is going through an individual lifelong journey. And we, there are those moments in our lives, for whatever reason, they are more meaningful to us. 
and sometimes they change our minds. And I really don't think that I can be that for people in the comment section of my videos or on my videos entirely. That's why honestly I feel like the people that watch my videos, uh, like when I think of who will watch my videos, I think of people that have, they've already had those transformational moments. They're now just looking for people like them, looking for a community, looking for people that just have like ideas about these subjects that they want to share or want to discuss. I am not interested in convincing people. I don't think that's possible. I think some I think you have to do a convince I think you have to convince yourself <laughs> with your own life experiences and just being open-minded about how many types of people there are in this world and why wouldn't you want the best for the most amount of people I don't know like I said I don't think being a leftist is radical at all I think it should be the normal again i just keep coming back to that like we have one planet earth it literally makes more sense that more people would want to share their resources and split them up in a way that is as much as you possibly can because there's always going to be error there's always going to be some like greed there's always going to be people that want more but in one way or another just for everybody to have enough enough for their survival I don't understand how that's a radical thought. I think you're the weird one if you don't want that, to be honest. <laughs> um, but anyways, let me know in the comment section what you thought. Um, thank you for watching. If you still are, subscribe if you'd like to continue talking about world domination. I'll see you in the next one.